Welcome to our podcast, where we talk about the interesting, frustrating, and inspiring experience we have as people with strongly held religious views working in corporate IT. We're not here to preach or teach you our religion, or lack thereof. We're here to explore ways we make our career as IT professionals mesh, or at least not conflict with, our religious life. This is Technically Religious. Religious communities sometimes have a fraught relationship with technology in general, and the internet, smartphones, and screens in particular. On the one hand, churches, synagogues, mosques, temples, etc. see the power that these technologies have to build, grow, and maintain contact with the community and spread the word. On the other, technology is often perceived as a cesspool of evil inclinations and a scourge that is destroying families and minds. As IT professionals within our religious communities, we're often asked to address and even fix those issues. In this episode, I'm joined in discussion by Josh Bigley. Hello. And also our returning guest, Keith Townsend, a.k.a. CTO Advisor. Hey there. And we are going to tell a few of our stories in this right. Now, before we dive into any of that, I need to write a past injustice and give Keith a chance to tell everyone a little bit about himself and CTO Advisor and what you're all about. So shameless self-promotion time, Keith. Oh, you know what? It, it is the Technically Religious Podcast, so we'll, we'll start with that. I, I am a uh, Christian, and I've been a Christian for almost as, well, yeah, almost as long as I've been in IT. So I've been in IT a little bit over 21 years, and I've been a Christian for about 21 years. Uh, I blog and stuff, mainly uh, talk to CTOs or uh, infrastructure architects, uh, and you can find all that goodness on thectoadvisor.com. Fantastic. All right. And the next thing I'd like to do is point out for uh, people who've been listening to this podcast for a while, this is actually episode number 15, if you're keeping track, that this episode is sort of counter to our normal style or story. Usually we talk about our life as an IT person who is recognizably or somehow visibly connected to a faith, moral, or ethical worldview. And yet today we're going to turn that on its head. Today we're going to talk about our life within our community of faith, but being someone who who is recognizably a geek, you know, somebody who is associated with technology in some way. Um, and where I'd like to start the conversation is what is good about that? What is good about being a geek in the pews? So I just want to point out that I thought you were going to say that today we were going to be witty, insightful, and funny. <laughs> You are always all three of those things. I don't know. I mean, and self-deprecating, so it's all good. So, right, Josh, well, you, you should have known that that wasn't the case because you, you guys had me back if, you know, you had oh, different guests. Oh, see? Yes. The humility. The humility is just uh, rife <laughs> a lot around the hair. So, okay, no, really. What is it? What's good about being a geek, you know, at, at our church or our synagogue or whatever? What, what does, how does that help us? I mean, we're usually the first ones to know the Wi-Fi password. <laughs> <laughs> okay and we can share it with others yeah and usually help them get their devices on share and then, share what? Yeah, and then <laughs> when you know everyone i think everyone's service is going to the point where they're using powerpoint presentations to drive the sermon which is you know kind of crazy so whenever the the powerpoint doesn't progress to the next slide or or the screen goes uh -huh. blank after about five minutes you can get up and walk up to the av guys and you know usually get it sorted out in 35 40 seconds while everyone looks you know it, at you awkwardly got it okay so i just want to hold down my leg of the conversation and just say that within the orthodox jewish community this is actually not a thing first of all on the sabbath you can't touch any of that stuff so ah. certainly no powerpoint presentations uh at that point but also uh, it just, you know, d weekday services tend to go very fast. They're very business-like. So none of that. Um, but so that's interesting. Do you guys have AV at all? Uh, I will say for the most part, I, I say certainly there's AV because there's lectures and discussions. But in terms of worship, no. Worship is still a very analog experience. Hmm. Um, in fact, there's a big push in a lot of um, you know Jewish spaces and certainly Orthodox spaces to have people leave their their screens, their cell phones and things outside at the door and not even be tempted in between certain parts of the the prayer or davening to even be tempted to look at at their phone while it's going on. You know, you're there to talk to the boss, 
you know, as just as you wouldn't go into your, you know, CEO or CTO's office and in the middle of a conversation say, oh, hang on, I just got to check this text, you know, oh, wow, this is Facebook message. This is awesome. Like you wouldn't do that with your boss. Don't do that with the big boss. That is a pretty good lesson. Yeah. When um, I was a U.S. Sunday school yeah. uh, teacher, I used we used to have a, a box of technology. Uh -huh. um, and that was, it was a, a box that we would put on the table. And when the kids would come in, this was at the height of the clash of uh, clans craze. Clash uh. of clans craze. That's really hard to say. And we used to make them put their cell phones in the box. And otherwise, it, it was, uh, you know, a clash of clans off your, your lap while you or underneath your scriptures, or mm -hmm. it was just a thing. Right. So um, you, you guys have inspired me. I, the, I think I'm going to start leaving my uh, phone in the car yeah. so mm -hmm. that I'm not tempted at all. You know, I, I don't, I really don't pull it out after service, that's for sure, because I'm usually, you know, talking and, and ministering and et cetera. But you know what? The, I, I do use it as my, to look up scripture. And you can get kind of sidetracked. You're like, oh, you, you know, I'll I'll check Twitter or whatever, and it, right. that, that you, that's a good point. Right. So, so I, go I, ahead. One of, I think one of the things that um, that resonates with me, and it, so in Mormonism there are uh, four books of Scripture. Uh, you know, the, the Bible, the King James Version of the Bible, also the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price. Um, in the Book of Mormon, there's a, a prophet, um, King Benjamin, and in Mosiah two seventeen, which is what Every every Mormon out there is going. Oh yeah, I know this verse, right? It's uh, <laughs> it says. I know behold, that one. I know yeah, that I know one. that. I know. I had to memorize this once, right? Um, and behold, I tell you these things that you may learn wisdom, that you may learn that when you are in the service of your fellow beings, you are only in the service of your God. And I think that that whole idea of uh, serving our fellow man um, is is intrinsic. Of you know, that's what God wants me to do. So when it comes to fixing technology. Um, it's something that we know how to do and we're really good. When we see that person fumbling with their technology, our, our natural instinct, or at least my natural instinct, is to reach out to them and say, hey, can I help you with that? Or right. you, know, you, you see them, you know, they're starting to get frazzled. And, you know, uh, Mormons use technology in their lessons. And you see you know, that, that, uh, that individual up there and they're trying to get that PowerPoint presentation or that streaming video to work. And knowing that you can just step up and in a couple of seconds have it up and running and going, that's very reassuring. It, right. it's, it's, it, that feels right to me. And I think the best part of that is we all understand that they're not there for the technology piece. And so we're watching as the technology is pulling them away from the holier moment. They're there to teach a lesson. They're there to share a thought. They're there to, to you know, share some of their experiences. And they're getting hung up. Their rhythm, their pacing, their confidence is being hit. And you don't want that. And you can help get that back on track. And, and I think you're right. That's a, a great uh, a, a great way of looking at it. I think the other thing is that as representatives of technology, we can help sort of de-escalate people's feelings about technology. I said in the intro that a lot of times in faith communities, technology is looked at as something to be mistrusted. And we have a chance to be an ambassador um, of technology in the sense that we are part of the community we are a trusted voice. We understand the rules of the road. You know, at no time, I'll speak for myself, are we going to say, yeah, no, Playboy's okay. Just read it for the articles. Like, <laughs> you're not, you're not going to do that. You know, you're not going to say, oh, it's okay. It's whatever. If it's not okay, you understand that it's not okay. And they understand that you understand it. So when you're giving advice, you have a chance to to point out where th something is a true risk and where something is only a perceived risk. Yeah, so you know one of, the, one of the big challenges that we have is uh, as religious people is sometimes we're perceived as being anti-science or even anti-technology. Sure. Uh, so, you know, nuclear medicine is a fantastic innovation, uh, but nuclear medicine and nuclear bomb, uh, nuclear bombs are cut from the same genome. Right. Um, you know, chemical engineering is wonderful. It transforms our lives uh, in ways that we. Uh, we now, in, in the midst of chemical engineering, and I, I, uh, I had read a, a great book in the last year or so about the CRISPR technology. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, crazy stuff, right? Um, yeah. But chemical weapons are horrible things that you know that kill people and maim them. Um, and then, of course, because we're geeks, uh, we recognize that, of course, the the holy trinity uh, of geekdom is uh, Star Wars three, four, and five. Uh, 
Or yeah. wait, no, four, five, and six. So Thank four, you. Five, four, five, and six, right? Um, and Jar Jar Binks is, uh, I, I think the word that Should... you wrote here is an unholy abomination. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I will say the character is conceived. The actor is fantastic, and I do not want to contribute to uh, his struggles because he really, you know, actors get sometimes get jobs they don't expect to go the way that they go. But yeah, I'm not a fan of the first uh, three movies. Um, going back to CRISPR, it's interesting because there was just a, uh, a segment on NPR today that was talking about somebody who's uh, creating CRISPR babies. And yes. they thought they would make a, a person, a human that was uh, HIV resistant. And it turns out that there's all sorts of downstream consequences. However, that same technology can be used to to uh, correct some amazingly impactful diseases when used. So even within the same technology, um, you know, there's a balance there. And I think that being a technologist within a faith community allows us to help point out that these are uh, opportunities to make moral, ethical, I'll say righteous or, or uh higher power directed decisions about a tool, whether that tool is a hammer or a CRISPR. And then I think the other thing that, you know, we hadn't talked about is that personally, it, the discipline of many technologists gives me the ability to ask critical questions and even critical mm -hmm. questions of my own faith. Uh -huh. So that, you know, for people that, you know, we spread the word of just believing in God and we get challenged on that, you know, we, we as technologists, we actually come with a reputation of being critical thinkers. So I think it gives us, you know, this this moral authority to speak on faith because we're reasoned in our approach to our faith in most instances. Right. Right. And and it also lets us debunk. So there's, again, the debunking of, you know, no, that's actually, you know, the, the IRS is not going to call you <laughs> and ask you for your password exactly. and things like that. There's a story that's told in Orthodox Jewish circles that I hate. It's one of those apocryphal stories. But frequently in, in Orthodox circles, when you're talking about technology, it comes out. So there's a, there's a, a Kolel guy, a guy who learns scripture as his job, you know, all day long, eight, 10 hours a day. This is what he does. And he needs to make a living. And so uh, he goes and he gets a job and they put him in an office and they give him a computer. And the next weekend he is violating the Sabbath and he's doing drugs and he's having an affair. And, and, they tell it every time and every time you can hear my eyes rolling in my head and you know it, it you know you don't want to you don't want to contradict you know uh rabbinic authority but you have to stand up and say i think there might have been a couple of other problems with this guy i don't think the computer was really the thing that threw him over the edge if the next weekend he was violating the sabbath and doing these things and it sounds a little far-fetched anyway um so, you know, it gives you a chance to be, like you said, that critical voice that pushes back a little bit. Yeah, we call those faith promoting lies in, in Mormonism. Uh, I don't know <laughs> oh what else. Gosh. Sure. Yeah, okay. I call it religious really glurge. Like really, well, but no, this I... happens in, in technology, too. You know, we have this desire to further our point and not necessarily st stretching the truth. But uh, and this happens on social media as well, not just technology, but social media. Uh -huh. Our minister last week gave an incredible sermon on basically social media and uh, revealed this fact that 70 percent of the stories shared on Facebook are in fake and in, in fact, fake news. But it is an example of our bent on wanting to promote our version of the truth. Mm -hmm. And that is, I think, the thing that we enjoy about the technology space, that you can spread information extremely fast. But also, you know, part of that story uh, is that you can spread falsehoods or uh, stretches of the truth extremely fast as well. Right. You know, uh, twice in a row, uh, Keith, you've now made a comment that's made me think of a book that I'm reading. Uh, it's entitled The Case for the Real Jesus by Lee Strobel. And uh, Lee is a, he's a journalist, um, also was an atheist and then converted to Christianity. 
and he meets with someone who actually lives over in Nova Scotia. So I, I live on the east coast of Canada, and he meets with this uh, historian and professor, and he's talking about the the stretches of truth that have happened within Christianity since the time of Christ, and how it, we're looking at these uh, these Gnostic gospels that have come out over you know the last you know, 50 or 60 years, they've really come to light and challenging this narrative of Jesus with, uh, which was, you know, the Coptic, the Coptic gospels uh, with these Gnostic gospels and saying, oh my goodness, you know, these things, uh, the, you know, they were written a hundred years after Jesus was uh, on the earth, but, you know, they're saying that Jesus, you know, really had three eyes. And I know that that's not what they're saying, but it's, it's that <laughs> idea that we can make these, uh, we can make these, uh, allegations and it's really hard to back them up because the disinformation out there is is you know it it's there it, it's really difficult and I, I will point out that there is one area in which disinformation I I think really needs to be clamped down on and that's and that's IT security um, you yeah. should use a password manager like it is not just a scary thing do not use the same password on every single website right. You know? Use multi-factor authentication. Like these are things. Um, it, it, it's not just the boogeyman. You you should do that. Yeah, and I think that goes back to uh, you know debunking things that that are you know patently untrue, reinforcing good behaviors. I think that that allows us to do it. The other thing is that because we are representative technology, it gives us a chance to um, to model good behavior. Uh, you know. Uh, to, to quote Bill and Ted, to be excellent to each other uh, online, as well as in, in the pews, you know, as well as in, in our faith uh, building. Um, there's a local uh, Rebbitzin, a, a, a rabbi's wife who is an author and a blogger, and she is known around here for saying that the only time she posts on social media is after she's asked herself three things about the things she wants to say. Is it true? Is it kind? And is it necessary to say it? Hmm. And whenever she says that, the immediate reaction from the audience is, well, then I wouldn't post anything. And she holds up her fingers and says, right, exactly. <laughs> maybe, maybe you should think about all the things that you're posting. And I, I, I love that. And, and I, I aspire to it. I can't say that I always uh, meet that aspiration, but I, I, I like it. So it gives us as technologists a chance to say, yeah, you know, you can be in these spaces and use them to uplift, to to shine a light, to do all those things. Like, you know, you can do that. Uh, wait, so based on those three rules, are, are you announcing the end of the podcast? Are, are we are we disbanding? <laughs> I, I don't, I believe that everything that we have talked about uh, in our episodes is certainly kind and true to the best of our ability. And I, I think it's necessary. Okay, I'm, I'm willing. I was I was just concerned. I thought you were firing us. No, <laughs> there you go. That, that was no. a very kind, but it was a very kind way in which he did it. Right, right, and that's the other thing is that you know everyone I think has become aware that people say more than it, on online to people than they might say face to face, and uh, you know I I don't know. Uh, uh, your side of it, but I know that Judaism has very specific rules about what they call rebuking another person, you know, when you want to give them uh, a little bit of a correction. And that's, you, you are not permitted, in fact, you are commanded not to rebuke somebody unless you are able to do it in private, to do it with only love in your heart, and to only do it when you are certain that the other person will hear you. So if the other person is not in a headspace to understand what you're going to be saying, you are commanded to keep your mouth shut. And so, the same thing, if you, in saying it, you are going to become agitated or unhappy or upset, you're not allowed to say it. All those things. And I think that, again, social media gives us a chance to practice that and to, and to model it. Yeah, I, I, try and, I try to be an example on social media. I am uh, a bit of a pot store, and and uh, <laughs> to, to say it mildly, but I try to be um, I try to be provocative about being offensive is the is the goal. But, and but I, I think but, one of the things that uh, 
I personally, like a personal failing of mine, in which I wish I can get better, and I've kind of stepped away from talking politics for a little while, especially as Melissa's sick and I'm trying to focus on, a, you know, on positivity for a while. Mm-hmm. The one of the areas that I that I felt is I'm very passionate about uh, systematic just challenges of minorities. So whenever, you know, kind of something happens politically in that space, it's really hard for me to balance Christianity and my desire to uh, and this is not a godly desire to to uh to get justice because it's not for us to get if you know from a christian perspective that's for god to provide Mm -hmm. and that you know so i try and model that and sometimes people will you know i get a lot of compliments on my ability to just have very difficult but yet respectful conversations but I, I, I have to be honest, my heart is not always coming from a great place. But it's really great advice to, you know, kind of be the change you want to see. Well, and I will say that, that first of all, you know, struggling with or wrestling with something is is the work. Um, so, you know, the fact that it's not easy means that you're at that, you're at that point of growth, right? You aren't in the easy space where everything is just simple. You're, you're, you're pushing yourself. But I will also say just having watched your social media accounts that you focus on issues and you focus on events, but you don't focus on people. You are willing to go after an idea and you're willing to go after, to call out, you know, an event or an attitude, but you don't call out a person. And I think that that now some people may feel threatened by you challenging an idea, whether that's about virtualization or social justice or any of those things. But that's that's what they brought to the table. You're just calling out this situation, this design, this architecture, this finance, you know, this financial structure. This is not this is suboptimal. And they don't and like that. that. And, I, and I think the that comes from a space from being able to look at myself and people show have shown me in the past where I just wasn't Christ-like in loving other people. You know, Christians, we have a very difficult time with the concept of homosexuality and, Mm -hmm. and sexual identity. So we look at that as a different weighted sin than other sins. And I've had that struggle in my past. Mm -hmm. Uh, And to be in then, to not look at people with the same love of Christ that I looked at. So I try and address issues and not people, because if I treated people, if people, people treated me the same way that, uh, that I treated people in the past when I had those views, then I would never have changed. So I try and give people the same grace I was given, which is, you know what? This person has the capacity to change and if we focus on the issue, then hopefully they'll uh, have the space to tra- change. So we have to give the space to have the conversation. And this is going back to technology. Technology gives us the space to have the conversation, but we have to model what that looks like. We know you can't listen to our podcasts all day, so out of respect for your time, we've broken this particular discussion up. Come back next week, where we pick up our conversation with the things that challenge us as ambassadors of IT within our religious community. Thanks for making time for us this week. To hear more of Technically Religious, visit our website, technicallyreligious.com, where you can find our other episodes, leave us ideas for future discussions, and connect with us on social media. A Jew, a Christian, and a Mormon walk into a mosque. And none of them knew how to fix the router.